In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Eternal Father, you called St. Philip the Evangelist to open his mouth and begin with Scripture, tell the good news of Jesus Christ. By virtue of our baptism, we too are called to work for the salvation of souls. Instill in our hearts the zeal of St. Philip, that we may convert hearts and minds to your Son, Jesus Christ, our Savior, who lives and reigns forever and ever. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Welcome to the St. Philip Institute podcast. I'm your host, Father Justin Braun, and with me this week is Luke Arredondo, the Director of Faith Formation for the St. Philip Institute podcast. Luke, thanks for being with me. Uh, As we record today, uh, we're getting ready for the season of Lent to draw to a close and uh, enter into that great time of prayer called Holy Week. And so, Today, we're going to be talking all about Holy Week. We're going to dive into the liturgies. We're going to dive into the scripture. Um, We're going to dive into, hopefully, some deeper spiritual uh, reflection for each of us uh, to consider in in different times of prayer, uh, where we're at now. We we don't know where we're going to be, actually, when we get there. It might be that we're all praying the entirety of Holy Week from our homes uh, via live stream. Uh, but wherever we might be at that point, we can we can find out a lot of richness by looking at the Word of God and looking at the way of prayer uh, to to get more out of it and uh, to really know that the joy of Easter and the triumph of Christ over death and sin is is worth all of the liturgical celebration and all the effort we put into it. So I'm glad to have you with me this afternoon, um, and we're gonna be kind of doing a little different show today because we we actually just have to kind of cut some time. Usually we do these for about an hour. We're going to do it in about 45 minutes today. So instead of him hauling through some of the usual stuff, I want to kind of dive right in if that's cool with you. Um, So the the big theme here is Holy Week. Uh, But before we dive into some of the particulars, I do want to ask you, um, okay, you're, you know, PhD, father, you are uh, a man who is discerning priesthood. Was Holy Week a big deal for you as a kid? Did you have? Do you have some sense of memory of of that time? I don't have a deep memory of Holy Week as being something that was part of my whole life growing up. But when I moved to Mississippi, we started going to mass more regularly, and I, for some reason, decided to try and pay attention to Father Reardon's homilies. Mm. Uh, one of the things that I did was I tried to see how long I could pay attention to his homily before I zoned out. So I used my stopwatch on yes. the, uh, to see, and I found I had about a 9 to 11 minute attention span. One of his homilies, before I zoned out, he made the, the point that if you really wanted to celebrate Easter, you would not come on Easter Sunday. You would come on for the vigil mm. at, at night. And he said the same thing about Christmas, and he made the point consistently enough that I started, I told my parents who were discussing what, what time we were going to go to either Christmas Mass, in the, like on the 25th, or Easter Sunday, and I forget which one it was. I overheard them, and I said, hey, Father Reardon said very matter-of-factly, and he is my only authority that I would have listened to <laughs> or known of at this time, that if you really want to go to the Easter Mass or you know, the Christmas, you go the night before. Mm-hmm. And so we did start going to both the Christmas Vigil Mass and the Easter Vigil Mass when I was about 10. Okay. And then we kept that up. Uh, and then I was a musician for a long time and would play at many churches for the, the, the Vigil Mass uh, around town, anyone that was doing it and needed trumpet players. My dad and I would do that for both Christmas and Easter. So the Triduum... I didn't really get exposed to until I was in college. Okay. But the Easter Vigil is something that I have have probably been doing since I was about 10. Okay, very cool. So for me, Cradle Catholic, Northeast Texas, I I remember kind of, you know, I I certainly know my mom. She was the best and was like, we're going to all these things all the time. Yeah. Yes, ma'am. But kind of when you had that coming of age moment, I remember – it was Palm Sunday, you know, kind of the beginning of, of right. all of Holy Week. 
Because I remember thinking, why is there a donkey in the parking lot? <laughs> we were one of those churches wow. that at some point, and I don't even yeah, remember if it was yeah. my home parish, but there was definitely a donkey. There was definitely a priest or a deacon riding on it, and definitely me thinking, what are we doing? <laughs> um, and then having, you know, obviously many years since then, the chance to, by the grace of God, enter into it more and more deeply through the years, and as a priest, you know, getting to celebrate it and it's just it it is such a rich week for us to pray and to really physically mentally uh just with our whole selves our our body mind and soul to enter into the depths of our christian faith and so it's so important that yeah. we do encourage you know you said you were 10 and you could kind of remember some of the easter vigil like we we can't throw every kid at the age of two into the vigil. They're not going to make it, but they sure. could probably sleep through it. Uh, Until the maybe. baptisms. Right. Have, the, my Carol woke up in the baptisms oh, okay. this, this last year. We took all the kids to the yeah. Easter vigil, which we hadn't done previously, and uh, she woke up what, the, the first baptism. She, right. she woke right. up, was ready to go for the rest of it. Uh, I uh, The first time I experienced the triduum, actually, I think the whole thing, was when I was in uh, my first year of seminary. Mm -hmm. It was at a Benedictine monastery in in St. Benedict, Louisiana, uh, St. Joseph, Louisiana, whatever, Uh, St. Joseph Abbey. And that was, I mean, the the liturgical richness of Mm -hmm. the Benedictines doing the Triduum is something that just really changes your your perspective on what what a liturgy can look like and, and how many different symbols can be brought in, you know, mm-hmm. uh, just by following the ritual. I mean, they're not, right. they're not inventing they're anything, not making anything, just up. doing what is there, uh, how, how rich it can be. And, and the, also the absence, right? So the absence of light and sound, you know, like the way that it, silence was enforced after Holy Thursday and mm-hmm. after Good Friday, I mean, that, that speaks profoundly too. So it's not only, in the lit- in the liturgy itself, but but the rest of the time that we're filling in that week that has has a potential to really be powerful for yeah. us. Yeah, yeah, I think that's a, a great insight that not a lot of people think about is that there's there's when we're not active, there's this whole spiritual meditation that's supposed to be occurring mm-hmm. throughout this week, and 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 really we're gonna we're gonna start to dive kind of in, into the questions and get a little more deep, but the that going back to the beginning of Lent, we talked about the need for silence. Like during Holy Week, there's a great need for more interior recollection, focusing on the scriptures, focusing on the story of, of our Lord's passion, his triumphal entrance into Jerusalem and what happens, you know, that week. It, yeah. it goes from the high point of his human life, in a sense, yeah. to the worst moment in all of history. Uh, so Holy Week itself, um, just... What it is, uh, I'm going to talk about that a little bit, and then uh, you can kind of fill us in a little bit why we, we enter into this time. But Holy Week spans from the, the Mass of the, the Passion uh, or Palm Sunday uh, through the Easter Triduum. And within that Holy Week, uh, we have the Mass on Sunday, and then we have what's called Holy Monday, Holy Tuesday, Holy Wednesday, and then Holy Thursday. Um, and Holy Thursday is traditionally two liturgies. Uh, in the morning, you would have the Chrism Mass, where mm-hmm. the priest re- priests renew their promises with the bishop, united with the bishop. The bishop consecrates the holy oils uh, that are going to be used by the priest in all the parishes throughout the diocese for the coming year. Um, and then in the evening, you have the, the Mass of the Lord's Supper. And then you enter into properly at the end of the Mass of the Lord's Supper, uh, into uh, you're entering into the Triduum through that. And so there's the, the procession with the Blessed Sacrament to the Altar of Repose, which is a kind of a reminder of our, our Lord's time in uh, the Garden of Gethsemane to be, to be in prayer with Him. And the yeah. churches are emptied of the tabernacle is empty, the altar is stripped. There's a lot of physical things that happen. Mm-hmm. Um, and then we have uh, the, the Good Friday services, um, which uh, is uh, unto itself a great liturgy, and we'll talk a little bit more in detail when we get into the Triduum itself. But um, And then we have Holy Saturday in anticipation of the Easter Vigil. So that's, that's pretty much Holy Week, but... Why does the church call us to do this every year? What's what's going on there? The way that the catechism describes it is that the purpose of Holy Week is, in a certain sense, compressing what we do in the entire year. So the, the church says that, the, or the catechism says, the entire liturgical year is a time for us to 
meditate on and enter into the different mysteries of Christ's life, right? And so we have different liturgical seasons that have particular focus of, of certain mysteries of Christ's life, but Holy Week is where it reaches its climax. Uh, the, the way that the Catechism describes it is that everything leads to Holy Week and everything proceeds from there. Mm-hmm. Uh, the way the, litur- the, the liturgical calendar uh, moves, it's to and from yeah. Holy Week, and that the brilliance of Holy Week shines on both sides of it. So it, it illuminates what it precedes it and what happens afterward. Mm-hmm. And of course, it's the culmination of Christ's you know, Christ's mis- uh, mission on the earth uh, is is in, is captured by the liturgies of that week. Um, so it is sort it is certainly it is in a certain way the central moment, the central event of Christ's uh, mission. And so we take an extraordinary uh, time and uh, liturgies that are very very out of the ordinary mm-hmm. uh, that that highlight certain different dimensions of Christ's um, passion so that we can re-enter into it. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's it's a great sense of that whole liturgical timing, that the, the Lord is, is coming to us, ever nearer to us as we go ever nearer to Him through, through the sacred liturgy. Um, but we don't discount any part of His life. Uh, right. We, we don't just go to the highlights. We don't just go to the transfiguration. We don't just go to the Sermon on the Mount. We don't just go to the, the joyful times. We, we also have to enter into the sorrowful. Mm-hmm. And we, we know certainly... Uh, Many a times it's been said, but it's true. There, there's no Easter Sunday without Good Friday. That there, yeah. there is a there's a real need for mankind, but particularly Christians as ones who follow Christ to enter into and identify more readily with the life of Christ. Um, and we do that through the great actions of the Church itself, through the liturgies of that week called Holy Week. So, Holy Week can become. Uh, I, I will promise you this as a priest. It can become a very fretful time uh, if you're not a person of good preparation. And, and as a priest, that, that I mean that like if we don't really get ahead of the ball yeah. and like try to prepare, for, you know, if you're preparing for Holy Thursday, Thursday afternoon at 6 p.m., we're in trouble. Um, but as a family, you know, there's also the reality that it, it, to a great degree, you could show up for these services, these liturgies that are done, and kind of miss the point. And so yeah. to a degree, I, I'm curious for you as a, as a father, as a husband, how do you kind of help your kids get ready to go to the Mass of the Lord's Supper, even Palm Sunday, which is, it's, again, one of those times of the year that everybody yeah. comes because you get something, yay. Yeah. <laughs> um, but why? You know, it, it can fall in deaf ears, right? Yeah. Well, uh, we have, I think, a unique practice at my house, although maybe, maybe this year it won't be so unique. Uh, it's one of our projects that the Institute is trying to sort of encourage people to join in. So we've, at for the past eight years, this is our ninth year doing it at my house, have practiced something that we have called Holy Week of Darkness, mm. um, which I've had uh, a couple of occasions to talk about in, in various videos. But essentially what it means for us is when when sunset, uh, when, when we get to sunset on Palm Sunday, uh, we light candles around the house, and we go around chanting the creed, uh, and we turn off all the lights and we do not turn the lights back on uh, until Easter Sunday. Huh. Uh, so we we actually try and live the the entirety of Holy Week in darkness as a way of reminding ourselves that like our true light comes from Christ. And mm-hmm. so, uh, as we'll we'll get to later, the, the the liturgical symbolism of light and darkness in the Easter Vigil liturgy really speaks to my kids because they haven't seen any lights right. for a week. So, we, I mean, that's the, 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 the most obvious thing is that we're not using lights, but what that does is it reshapes the way that our whole week goes, the way that we use our time. We can't be cooking late in, in the evening. We, right. When the sun's de- down, that's it. So we're, we spend more time together as a family. We're turning off screens. We're not watching uh, videos. Uh, we're not watching TV shows, movies, just we're spending time as, as a family together. Of course, praying mm-hmm. uh, as, as fervently as we can, for, as fervently as you can with four kids that right. are, you know, <laughs> a very young age. But that's that's what we've done. It's developed more each year, and it's. I know that my kids look forward to that week starting. I right. don't know on Thursday afternoon if they're still really digging it, uh, but... 
on Palm Sunday, they're very excited to turn off the lights. They're very yeah. excited. This is our thing. This Holy Week of Darkness. They, Holy Week to them is a big deal that they know is coming. Right. They're, they're asking now, it's Lent. When's Holy Week? Is it coming up? So that's something that's been effective for us is to, to show them this week is different. Right. This is just not just Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, and then we go to church a few extra times. We go to church a few extra times because the entire week, week has, has, has been consecrated. Right. And that's a, a great, gosh, it's such a beautiful, practical thing you can do, and it's age-appropriate. Like, I'm sure as your daughters get older, you're going to be able to entertain some of their questions as they come up and you're you may be even be able to take one of them aside this year and say, you know, look for this at Holy Thursday Mass. Uh, yeah. You know, but explaining all the symbols and all all of what's going on, you don't, you, you can't do that. You have to do age appropriate kind yeah. of pieces. But as you said, just something as subtle as turning off the lights. Hash, hashtag Holy Week of Darkness. Holy Week of Darkness. Yeah. We need to see this in people's lives because it is such a practical thing that's really not that terribly inconvenient. Let's remember, if yeah. there's an emergency, you can turn on the oh, lights. Course. All those things. Um, if your but, kitchen doesn't have any windows, you might want to turn on the light. Right. But you're, <laughs> what you're doing is you're inviting them into uh, a, a sense of liturgical time. That yeah. Where we can kind of step out of the here and now and enter into this eternal now that, that God is ever present in and understand him. So it's it's a, it's a beautiful practical tip. And, and as a aside, just to encourage parents also, when it comes to understanding the, the the rest of what we're going to be talking about, understanding all the aspects of the Triduum, um, the best counsel I can give you is let your kids experience it and then let them ask questions. Yeah. You know, they're going to come away with things that you won't have thought of, and and that will push you to be a better teacher and, and to be more faithful in your understanding of what it is you're experiencing. We right? also, we do a washing of feet uh, on Holy Thursday, so we, we I wash everyone's feet in the family and then uh the kids wash uh, my feet and wash my wife's feet mm. and we have uh very special bread on holy thursday some fancy loaf of something that we couldn't yeah. have made ourselves and uh we get sparkling uh cider for the for the kids poured in like our plastic wine glasses yeah. you know uh like like a sort of a last supper and we read the gospel accounts to them during that meal uh, that's another one of the things that we, that we do, and, and they, they really look forward to it. They're yeah, very man. excited about their sparkling cider. I kind of want to come do Holy <laughs> Week at your house, and who knows, this year with coronavirus up in the yeah. air, it's, it's going to look a little bit different. Well, but it, it will be a project the Institute is going to be promoting on, on Facebook. We're going to have a group, and it's going to be a whole whole thing that's in the works right now. Right. Um, so so look out for that. Yeah, yeah. to help you all have the best... Uh, the best Holy Week ever, even if it happens to be in the midst of a worldwide pandemic. So yeah. uh, we've been using some words here, uh, kind of true to them reflexively. Uh, for you and I, we're, we're theologians, we're men who study uh, these things, but... Uh, what is the triduum? You know, just that's a basic question a lot of Catholics ask. What you say this word, Father? What does it mean? The triduum is the shortest liturgical season of the whole year. It is its own season. You're not in Lent anymore. You're in the triduum, and it is Holy Thursday, Good Friday, and East, uh, Holy Saturday, Easter yep. Saturday, or the Saturday of the Easter Vigil. Right. Yep. And even that gets yeah. You're like, wait, how do I say these <laughs> things? So yeah. So it's it's three days, uh, and it is it's impressive that. In a sense, the Church, as you said, really reiterates this in the Catechism, that this is the focal point of the entire year. Yeah. Um, we call it the Super Bowl, kind of, as priests. You know, it's like <laughs> everything builds up to this, and yeah, the rest of the season is kind of, after that, it's like, I don't want to say it's off-season, but everything really pull, pours out from uh, what we, we are doing that week, and not just at a physical level. It is more arduous. There are things that we're doing. Yeah. You know, priests here, I can tell you, a ton of confessions in that week. Um but entering into that most sacred night, you know, the, that, that profound understanding that Jesus loves us so very much that he instituted in the Last Supper a pattern and a means by which he can remain with us yeah. substantially. He doesn't say you know, do this in memory of me as if he's speaking symbolically. In no way, form, or fashion 
does he use language that <laughs> intimates a symbolism? He he is doing these actions. He's recalling other moments of their the apostles' experience with him, particularly you know John chapter six that when he said, "He who eats my flesh and drinks my blood will have eternal life." He's that's summed up right in their face, and and and, and he invites us into that intimacy with him at the altar. He invites us once again to be with him as he gives the greatest gift, which is the gift of himself in mm-hmm. the Eucharist. Um, but before he does that, you just talked about it, something so often, I think, lost in the midst of the the beginning of the Triduum is that it really begins with Christ laying down his life in service. Yeah. As usual. Yeah. Right? That he's going to wash the feet of the apostles. Um and that's a it's modern times right you think about it like that's a pretty gross thing to do yeah right we're super high particularly right now we're super mm-hmm. hygienic we wash yeah. our hands 400 <laughs> times a day the idea of touching somebody's feet but yeah our lord shows us he reveals to us as usual in, in his all his actions what it means to be servant and king yeah um pope benedict says in the jesus of nazareth the volume on the holy week uh that the washing of the feet is often uh, exegetes uh scripture scholars of, of various stripes will say that there's there's an example to be followed there uh or there's a gift to be given and that that you have mm-hmm. to choose sort of between one is it just something jesus did or is it something he wants us to do and, and pope benedict says no, it's a gift and an example. It's a, it's a pure gift for him to stoop below himself and do, uh, you know, something as menial as washing a feet, and it's an example for us that we're supposed to follow. Um, and there's the, there's a real humility of, of even even just you know I just wash my my kids' feet, and I've given them baths before, right? Right. That's it's like the only time that I do this. But to to stop and just wash their feet. Uh, in in, the, in a liturgical sort of way mm-hmm. is is a very humble thing. Like you can't, even though I'm not really grossed out by my kid's feet, there's no way to just wash the feet and like be careful about what you're touching. Right, or, you right. know, it's just, it, it's impossible. It's kind of a messy situation. It's, yeah, it's it's messy. And I feel really bad for them when they have to wash, when they wash my feet. <laughs> like, I'm like, I'm so sorry that my feet are so disgusting, you know. Um, and and there's, a, there's another layer to it too where, Peter, this is one of the, the times that Peter resists what Jesus wants to do. Mm-hmm. Uh, of course, you know, this happens more than once, but uh, Pope Benedict the Sixteenth says that in, in Peter's rejection, you know, you get a, a sort of a hint at, like, the, the fact that he's not, he's still that close to the end, not quite seeing what Jesus is about, right. what his ministry is about, and what the purpose is. Uh, but then he says, you know, Jesus' words are, you know, if, if you have your... If you have your feet washed, then the rest of you doesn't need to be washed. And the, and and he draws sort of a, a symbolic reading of that towards baptism and confession. That like, if you've been baptized, you can't be baptized again. You don't need to be completely washed. Right. So he says, you you, you know, Peter does not need to be completely washed. He only needs his feet to be washed. Um. And and I thought that was a a, a beautiful way of sort of thinking about right. it. Right. It's a great insight. And and that's a that. Again, that, that depth of what we see when we read somebody like Pope Benedict and uh, a man who spent has spent his entire life studying this and praying and praying this. I think that yeah. at a very practical level, that's yeah. that again, people ask, what can I do to have a better triduum? Pray. Remember, you're you know when you're entering into the the, the mass of the Lord's Supper, it is a prayerful action that you're you're entering into. Yeah. As it continues, there's there's movements that that again draw us out of our um out of our normal sunday mass experience so the the washing of the, of the feet one of the most stark things and I, I have to admit that it's always very humbling uh to have my feet i have bishop strickland has washed my feet a couple times when i was parochial vicar at the cathedral yeah just uh, there, there's a real exchange of of both our humanity our humility uh, our love for god love for our neighbor uh we, we enter into the mass and we 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 over consecrate, right? We, we as priests, we we consecrate in anticipation of yeah, the amount of right. people who might come to our Friday service because we don't have mass on Good Friday, mm-hmm. and then also for the needs of those who are ill. Um, so there's this this 
kind of overabundance that happens at yeah. that moment. And it's not something that I think a lot of people would pick up on. I'm just kind of sharing as a, from the priest perspective. But you look at it and you you immediately recall the the multiplication of loaves. The yeah. you know that there's this overabundance. And once again, what does our Lord do it, 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 through His church through the liturgy? He reminds us that He's more than enough. He's yeah. more than enough. And, and in that moment, you know, the priest gathers all the consecrated hosts. They are placed temporarily in the tabernacle. Um, the altar is is beginning to kind of look less and less like its normal self, and, and we're going to prepare to take our Lord to an altar of repose. And, and there, there's a great simplicity at this point that the Church has, I think, begun to recover a little bit, and I've seen it more and more amongst a lot of priests uh, trying to be more faithful to what you were talking about earlier, just doing the rubrics, doing yeah. the thing that it tells us to do. But this procession mm-hmm. with our blessed Lord and and taking our Lord and all those extra hosts and everything to an altar of repose and inviting people to remain in prayer. And, and that's, a, that's a huge... Yeah. Aha moment. For, yeah, and usually till midnight. Right, right. Till the, midnight. The, the, there is an opportunity to pray till midnight. Not right. that you necessarily stay the whole time. Right. You don't have to, but, but you're invited to. And 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 that's a that's again a thing where maybe you've got some little some younger children, um, or maybe you're just you yourself are tired. I'd really encourage you to to stick with it, to go with our Lord. You know, this is this is where you know. Could you not stay an hour with me? We have this this kind yeah. of sense of, okay, I've been to Mass, and, and it was a longer Mass than usual. Mm-hmm. The feet it's washing. late. Usually the homily's a little longer. We don't start until a little later in the evening, typically. Um, but can I come and remain with our Lord for, for even just a little bit to be there and and to pray with Him? And, and think about His agony in the garden. Yeah. And, that's, and that's really what we're trying to do, is not to make you feel bad, but to think about, to enter into, what was Jesus thinking at that point? What, yeah. what were, and you can read Scripture and kind of understand, it's pretty sweating blood, you know? Yeah. This thing just got real, right? Uh, like I, he's seeing all of this happening, and, and it's getting you know he's getting a little bit more anxious, so to speak. Um, but then we move into Good Friday, which has tremendous liturgical value for historical reasons. Um, for the the, I think the utter starkness of the mm-hmm. whole thing is really something that that affects everybody All right statues are covered right the there's there's no I mean, there's no frills there's no frills yeah. altars stripped there's no music it starts in silence yeah like the procession is, is in silence, in silence. Yeah. the priests remove their shoes and lay down on the floor yes yeah. it's, it's okay this is basically the worst Right, and it's supposed to be, you know, man killed God, yeah, deicide. Right, this is this is insane. <laughs> um, we enter into that with profound humility. We 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 look upon our sins. We wear the color scarlet to be reminded that we are washed in the blood of Christ. Our sins are forgiven through this great mm-hmm. heroic tragic act. Um, and then we enter into a, a lengthy time of prayer, reading the gospel, the whole yeah. passion narrative. Um, and it's the second time we've read the passion narrative, right? So right, we read a different days, one on Sunday, right? Right. Yeah. And then, um, and then we've got the the universal prayers. There's ten of them. There's a prayer. There's a psal- a, a psalm. Um, there's so it's th- this back and forth that happens. The standing, the kneeling. Mm-hmm. Um, and then there is the distribution of Holy Communion, which is very simple. The altar is set with a very plain white cloth. Um, and then, I'm sorry, I skipped ahead there. There's veneration. <laughs> I was thinking the vener- veneration. There's yeah. veneration of the cross. So we have the veneration of the cross, and that's such, a again, a profound moment of uh, – liturgical beauty in that you'll you'll see the priest will usually uh, on his knees reverence the foot of our Lord, kiss the foot of the Lord, and then the people come and uh, kiss different parts of our Lord's body or just kind of make an act or a gesture of reverence and then um, go back to the, their pews. But, you know, a lot of people accuse us of statue worship and all kinds of different <laughs> things, right? So, so during that time, 
you know, you're a dad, father, husband, scholar, guy who knows this stuff, but don't you just find it profoundly childlike? Not childish, but childlike. Right. We enter into this mystery with awe. Yeah. Yeah, no, and it's something, I think that's one of the times for, for my kids that they're able to get it. Mm. They don't find that to be such a weird thing. Interesting. I, I At least it doesn't seem like to me, yeah. especially the younger ones, it's like, the, oh, is this something I can actually do? Right. You know, uh, they have, if they're not receiving communion, then normally they, when we all go up there, they just, you know, they get a blessing. Or, right. Uh, so they, they sort of get excited about that. And, and, I, and I think that maybe... One of the things that they they can they can identify it with is it's like visiting someone's grave. Mm-hmm. You know, um, we uh, my wife and I uh, lost uh, a child a few years ago, and we would go visit the grave every now and then. And I think that they sort of get that idea of, of like someone who's who's passed away, but is but is not gone. Right. Right. And in paying them some respect, I think that that has connected for them um, at at Good Friday. Uh, but it it is very childlike, and that's really challenging for most adults. Right, but isn't it our Lord Himself who says, "Yeah, we've got to be <laughs> yeah. like children to enter Unless the kingdom." Unless you become of like God. one of these, yeah, <laughs> right. absolutely. And so we we do have to kind of. It's not suspending reality. It's it's entering into the super reality. It's entering yeah. into the things that are unseen and yeah. and falling more deeply towards our Father's heart. But this is a this is a great moment of liturgical beauty and and reverence the music does kind of kick back in during that time and it's music that kind of helps us focus on like oh sacred head surrounded and things like that that right. kind of bring us into that we receive communion and then after that again our lord is taken back to a tabernacle not in the church usually the altar of repose from holy thursday um and the church is bare again yeah. and the only thing that's exposed is the crucifix yeah and we leave in silence. There's, I've noticed overwhelmingly in the past seven years as a priest, um, people aren't really shaking hands and talking after no. that. They're kind of like shuffling off to their cars. And that's good. Like that's a sense of real profound um, prayer that they yeah. entered into. And they don't, and I'm glad I don't want to just, hey, how are you? Yeah. It's not appropriate. Like we just went through right. kind of the most arduous thing of our whole prayer life for the year. And then we walk out and we get in our cars and we go home. And, and hopefully Good Friday is not, you know, an opportunity for sin. It's an opportunity for continued reflection and grace. And then to, to kind of enter the great, great silence between yeah. the services of Good Friday and the great light. The right. Great service of light on the Easter vigil. So you are an Easter vigil king, in my opinion, <laughs> just because of the whole... Holy Week of Darkness. I mean, that's <laughs> that's just so profound. But I know that this is something you you uh, you worked as a director of RCIA in a big parish. You've you've helped bring a lot of people through the process of formation to come into the church. So, what's the what's the most important thing to you about the vigil? Like, what's what's the symbol that you love? What's the what, yeah that uh, that thing? Well, I really like. Um the way that the Easter Vigil liturgy begins outside of the church with a fire. Mm-hmm. Uh, there's a priest of, that was at the seminary, uh, Father Father Tom Guatz, who's a, a Salesian, and he said and he he said once he was asked to give a blessing for a fire, and he and he just goes, "There's something sacred about a fire," <laughs> <laughs> and it's so true, it's so simple. So you start with a fire outside of the church and the paschal candle for the next year right there's prayers an inscription of the year mm-hmm. a tracing of the alpha and the omega and that tracing of the alpha and omega the beginning and the end really captures a lot about what's what's about to happen if you mm-hmm. if you have a sense of what's going on at the easter vigil it is about the beginning and the end it is it is a a, con, a condensation uh, or a condensing of salvation history in the readings that are used and in the rites, uh, the the liturgical actions that are going on. So the candle proceeds into the church in darkness. The the deacon usually carries it and will will lift it up and sing, Light of Christ. We'll go farther up, Mm -hmm. do it again, go to the top, to the front of the altar, and and lift it up, and, and you can't see anything. 
unless your church has been built recently and there's emergency lights because of coding. You, <laughs> so ideally, you're in an old church that's actually black. I mean, you can't see anything but right. this one flickering light, and it's the light of Christ. And see, and it's the only hope we have. It's the only thing that we can depend on. It's the only thing you can see in in, in a an ideal situation in terms yeah. of the church. And then the exalted. Mm. Oh, it is such a rich prayer that that is sung that summarizes salvation history and the way in which Christ has always been present. Mm-hmm. He was sometimes present in a mysterious and figurative way in the old covenants, but then finally in the new covenant shines through. Um, later that candle is lit and the lighted small candles are passed out to everyone who has been baptized. And so there's this this rich symbolism of darkness, Christ's light, and then his light being shared but never diminished. Like the, the, right. the Paschal candle doesn't Go lose any of its brightness, but it multiplies mm-hmm. as, as it is shared through those who have been baptized, right? And so there's there's this tremendous symbolism of the light of baptism that, that fills the church that night, and you can see. Right. And it's it's a visual representation of what the church is supposed to be like. The church is supposed to help all of us, are supposed to help people see Christ's light that we've been given, which we're given. That's why we're given this candle at baptism, right? right. So if you, if you know what happens at a baptism and you know what happens at the Easter vigil, uh, then then suddenly there's this profound meaning to like the lights going on, right. literally, and also hopefully, you know, intellectually. And and that's just you haven't even gotten to the readings yet, right? right. <laughs> the readings are a quick tour through salvation history. Uh, and of course, I could read them all, but just so the first reading I have, it, it's the creation account, Genesis, Adam and Eve, right? Then there's an appropriate psalm. The second one, the covenant with Abraham, his test with Isaac, right? The next one, the third reading over here, Moses, right? And it is. The Exodus. We go after that to Prophet Isaiah. More prophets. You finally get to the New Testament, and then finally the Gospel reading of, of the Resurrection. And if 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 you only knew those moments, just those readings, if you only knew those stories, you have like the most raw outline of the history of salvation. Right. And and so of course this is why the Church chooses all of these readings for that liturgy because we are going from the Alpha the creation account, Mm -hmm. to the Omega, Christ's resurrection. Um, And that's just the liturgy of the Word. I mean, we could do more on this. uh, After that, you get to celebrate the sacraments, which I think you know a lot more about what that's like. So I'll let you you talk a little bit about that. Yeah, well, I think celebrating... So for for those who don't know, the Easter Vigil, um, those who are catechumens, those who are not baptized, adults generally, but also sometimes children, uh, this is when they will be baptized. For those candidates who are baptized but are being received into full communion in the Church, this is when they're going to be confirmed generally. Um, It it becomes a, a whole new way of... I think for a lot of people who go to this regularly, it becomes a whole new way of being renewed in your own mm. baptismal yes. promises. Um, and, I, and, I, and because I know a lot of people who are listening to us are already, you know, they're cradle Catholics or they've been baptized. But, but to be cognizant of that, like, it's not just for those who are being baptized. It's for all of us to be immersed again in the waters of baptism, to be reminded that we've entered into the life, death, and resurrection of our Lord. Um, there's a lot of coordination that happens and all that. We've got yeah. gowns, we've got candles, we've got, you know, adults, we've got kids, we've got sponsors. Um, but, you know, to not really get so focused on those things, that's why we have MCs, that's why we have good altar servers to try to hopefully handle the logistics, but to, to be prayerfully entering into that, to be reminded that, you know, I have received the grace of baptism. I am a child of God. The stain of original sin has been removed from my life. I, I walk as a child of the light and persevere, God willing, until the end of my days here on earth to be with him forever, Christ the light in heaven. Yeah. But I think the point that you brought up with the Alpha and the Omega in the scriptures is also seen in the liturgy of the Eucharist. Yeah. Cool. That, we, that really... All of that liturgy of the Word is preparing us and preparing those new Catholics yeah. for the first time that they'll receive Holy Communion. Yes. Um, and to go through the ritual prayer of the Eucharist 
as a Catholic to receive our Lord, to hear the names of those saints in the Roman canon that we hear week oh, after yeah. week. But, but there's a new sense of that's my family. Yeah, those are my people. Um, Chrysologus, you know that guy. He's he's my boy. Um, but we're we're entering into that with profound and new hope because it's real. Because yeah. we, we know that this is what Christ has done for us. He's risen for us. And the book of Revelation is really what kind of comes to yeah. mind when I oh, think yeah. of the Easter vigil. I think of, you know, flowing water from the temple. Uh, like it goes back to Ezekiel's prophecy also. But but Revelation is replete with liturgical mm-hmm. uh, symbols because it, it's a liturgical book um, in a great to a great degree. And when the church is fully illuminated, when the church is fully alive with those new children of God, mm-hmm. with those you know, new members of the family, and all of us gathered with them, you really get that profound sense of, okay, this is, this is home. This is where I really am called to yeah. be forever. And there's the element, too, of the, in the baptismal promises that the, pa- the whole parish participates right. in renewing those. All right, there's a, so there's, there are new people coming into the church, and there's a dual thing happening where if you are a Catholic and you see these new people coming into the church, it ought to encourage you that someone's right. deciding to join the church. Right. Like, look, someone wants someone wants to do this. Like, I should maybe take my own uh, commitment more seriously. Uh, mm-hmm. There are people that don't have to do this that have chosen to do it, and a lot. Of, I think a lot of cradle Catholics. Uh, you know, I grew up this way, thinking, you know, man, that's got to be weird to become Catholic. You know, right? And I just I didn't have any, It's just how it happened for me. Uh, so it's a, there's a certain inspiration for those who are already there, who are in the pews. But at the same time, it ought to be the case that the new, the neophytes, people who just come into the church, can receive support and encouragement from the people who are already there. So we we strengthen each other mutually right. by our presence and by our prayers during those reception, the, the reception of those sacraments. Yeah, there's a reciprocity that, that yeah. occurs in that that's just profound. And then. The fun part afterwards is the you know the uh, Easter vigil party, whether that's in your parish, at your home, or I, I know friends that historically they've gone to IHOP every time after whatever you know you go to Waterburger and have your first you know triple burger for the entirety of Lent after Lent uh, you know live it up, don't be stupid, uh, but to, to live in the joy of the resurrection. So um, we're going to come kind of down just to a, a real practical level in just a, a short or small way. Getting into the chariot, um, my my best recommendation because we really don't know where we're going to be with this. Yeah, with coronavirus. We don't They're know up how we're going to be experiencing all this. You can do much of this at home and look at the church uh, for that guidance. Look to the Saint Philip Institute. We're going to be providing on our website tons of resources for you to to be able to live out Holy Week in a profound way. Check and see if your parish is going to live stream uh, however mm-hmm. this is going to happen. But, you know, EWTN will be showing masses from across the globe and including what's happening in the Vatican. So please just don't ignore it if we're in the situation right. that um, that maybe we can't do this all together as a family. Um, Can I make another quick suggestion? Please do. Uh, Fulton Sheen, it's our Sheen Counter, that's one. Uh, the Fulton Sheen has a great book called The Seven Last Words, mm. um, and it's something that I have over the last... Oh, I don't know. Ten years. I try to read it every every Holy Week because it's very short. Right? This is not some sort of impressive amount of reading I'm doing uh, during Holy Week, but it's manageable and it is excellent. Mm-hmm. And I would highly recommend if you don't already have some spiritual reading in mind. Of course, the Scriptures, Liturgy of the Hours is great. Uh, the Liturgy of the Hours might be a little much for some people that aren't that aren't used to it. Right. This is something simple anybody could could. Um, benefit from and Absolutely. I would just strongly recommend to uh to, to give that a try because there's seven chapters in it. Yep. So you I'm, can read one little chapter each week. I pretty much read week. it. I do that every year yeah. too. It's <laughs> it's just so good. Fulton Sheen, God bless him. Such a great teacher. Well we want to thank all of you for listening or watching. Uh, we want to encourage you to, again, check out our website, www.stphilipinstitute.org. Please subscribe on YouTube. Uh, we're really trying to push to get over 1,000 subscribers. Go for broke and get as many as we can. We can that 
permits us to do more live stream type events on YouTube. Yeah. Um, and please leave a review on iTunes for this podcast. And, and don't forget to email us with suggestions or questions that you might have. Uh, we're so thankful to God to be able to continue to serve Bishop Strickland and the great Diocese of Tyler and, and beyond uh, to, to let all of you enter into the life of Christ more deeply. We hope we're helping you to do that. May God bless you and have a, a, a continued good and holy Lent and preparation for a good and holy week. The Lord be with you, and may Almighty God bless you, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.